you know, uh, you, you know, when Asif Bhai began, I think um, he was really able to uh, give a clear understanding of, you know, um, how the culmination of, you know, the Shaheen Bag sit in, sit in. And I think Arfa Ma'am rightly traced its uh, evolve, how it evolved from a protest or just a sit in. To a you know to a movement and what it meant for so many women, and so many stakeholders who were the journalists, the activists, the women, the men, and so many other people for the viewers. Um, how it evolved into a movement uh, which was much larger, much greater than just about a law or just about a bunch of people, and transcend uh, transcended many many ideas. And I am here to talk about a few of those ideas. Um, the narrative that we, you know, uh, largely see in the media and what I am repeatedly asked is what will happen now that the anti-CA protests are over. And my answer has been very simple. The Shaheen Bagh movement is still on, you know. And um, at, at what point did the movement transform, uh, you know, is then a natural question. And for, for that, my answer has always been that this transformation, it is a complex process and it is there are numerous ways in which the movement evolved and intensified. Uh, um, I would say that when we look at the when we look at Shaheen Bag, uh, we need to look at some of the events which were pre and post Shaheen Bag, uh, which combined to form a movement. You know, uh, whatever happened um, in Jamia and AMU on the. 13th and the 15th of December, you know, uh, the state sponsored violence uh, against protesting students and uh, uh, the violation of a central university of the country and the impunity with which, you know, uh, the police forces attack the universities is also a part of, of I believe, is also part of the Shaheen Bagh movement. Uh, when the Shaheen Bagh movement meant intensified and we saw sit-ins uh, happening all over Delhi um, and the Delhi pogrom was also a part of the movement. Uh, you know, trying to keep the narrative in the right side of history was also a part of the movement. Uh, you know, I just heard a few moments back, Asif Bhai was talking in some other space about how initially it was so difficult, uh, you know, uh, to uh, to claim, uh, you know, what the program was about, you know, and people would uh, often wrongly call it as a riot. But, you know, um, after a lot of effort, you know, we were claim, we were able to claim it as a pogrom because, uh, you know, our, our, as he rightly said, a riot has two sides, but a pogrom has only one side. And here we all know that, you know, um, it, two thirds of the victims of the Delhi pogrom were Muslims. So we all know what the Delhi pogrom was about, you know. So that is also part of the Shaheen Bagh movement. And, you know, uh, the healing process, the relief work, the rehabilitation work, the call for justice and the refusal to even keep quiet even after such uh, you know intensive disturbing traumatic experiences like the Delhi pogrom that again is part of the Shaheen Bagh movement and uh, the witch hunt that happened uh, in um, during the most strictest lockdown um, because of the COVID-19 pandemic in India you know the witch hunting that started happening uh, which culminated into the arrests of uh, you know uh, in many young activists and uh, students, including myself, and you know, hundreds and thousands of other people who uh, continue to have cases against them simply because you know they were protesting against the CE and the NRC. That all you know is part of the Shaheen Bagh movement. And um, and again, I say that the Shaheen Bagh movement is not over. Uh, every time when I go to the to the court, I feel the same sense of, you know, of struggle and resistance. Um, I have felt when, you know, we were 
sitting in 24-7 at the Jamia gate, you know, when we would go to other protest sites and, you know, raise slogans, sing songs of resistance um, and, uh, you know, uh, struggle uh, to basically just be heard and the democratization of space that our Farmam was talking about. Uh, it has come at a great price, you know. Uh, it was an everyday struggle against fake news, against being labeled as terrorists, against being labeled as you know um, uh, as being paid to protest against relentless and vicious uh, character assassination of Muslim women you know the assaults the regular assaults on our characters um, and the kind of image that was being constructed of Shaheen Bagh and of Chamia at that time, you know, I have that same feeling every time that um, I uh, I go to the courts, you know, um, I, you know, I struggle to fight, I struggle to resist. Um, and the fact that, you know, I come and I speak and I narrate um, our resistance and the stories of our resistance and our struggle, you know, um, and I can only speak for myself, but when I see other people, you know, a fellow um, accused and many, many other people who are, uh, you know, who are languishing in jail and also, uh, you know, fighting cases, even though out on bail, about like more than 1,500, uh, 1,600 people as per the Delhi police data, they, they were arrested. So in all of that, I see the movement come alive. Um, but there are two, three things that I want to talk about. Um, you know, when uh, when we see, um, you know, our, our world has become such that narratives are pitched against each other. So we often see the narrative of identity versus secularism. And, um, you know, if we see that, you know, uh, we see on one side that people were talking about Shaheen Bagh movement as something that was uh, to, you know, to save the constitution, to save the democracy, to save the unity of India. Uh, but it was about those things, but it was also, and more than that, about identity, about having a Muslim name in India, about, uh, you know, the years of betrayal of being pushed to the margins um, in the country uh, about injustices uh, such as the Babri verdict uh, and of course uh, the CAA the CAA the law itself which made Muslims say that you know enough is enough now um, it was about millions of Muslims who are ready to shed the historical burden of secularism that we have borne gracefully with dignity for years, you know. We questioned why the minority of 20% of Muslims uh, are burdened with carrying the majority of the burden of silence uh, in the name of saving secularism. As a 27 year old woman, uh, it irritated me why I have to carry a flag in one hand and the constitution in the other hand to protest so as not to be labeled as a threat to the national security of the country or even a terrorist. Uh, so, so again, Shaheen Bagh was much more than just a just about the the CAA or the NPR or the NRC. I think it was a culmination of so many things that, as Asif Bhai was also saying, and as you know, um, Arfa Mam was also saying, it was a struggle to uh, to you know to assert to basically um, you know uh, establish our identity. You know, and not unapologetically. Uh, Say that I am a Muslim and I do have a right to protest in this country, you know. Um, the second bone of contention that has come is whether it should be labeled as a Muslim women's protest. I think it is not a label. It is an acknowledgement. Uh, the acknowledgement of the resilience of Muslim women coming out in large numbers day in and day out, you know, the stubborn resilience, I would say, of women um, who refused to, uh, you know, forget and move on, basically. Um, but it does not erase the struggles of Muslim men or of all of those people, um, you know, who are belonging to a variety of religions, castes and regions. But it is a commend, it is commendable that Muslim women recla reclaim the space that rightly belongs to them and shattered the narrative of the spa a state which tried to pitch the Muslim men against the Muslim women by showing uh, that you know.
you know, uh, they were saving uh, the Muslim women by laws such as uh, triple talaq because they created the image of a Muslim woman who is subjugated, uh, who is, uh, you know, who's discriminated against because of the religion. And they, uh, they said that, you know, our religion is not what restricts us to come out in the public space. If we want, we will do it and we will fight. We are well capable of fighting, not just for ourselves, but for others around us, for our families, for our children, and not just that, for the entire country. And that is what uh, is, um, the, I think uh, that is what is commendable and and is and requires the acknowledgement that Muslim women did come in uh, come in large numbers, you know. As a Muslim in a patriarchal uh, society, as a, as a woman in a patriarchal society, I have struggled to make space for myself in this patriarchal space. And so have other Muslim women, not because we are Muslim, but because we are women. And we have successfully shattered, we have successfully fought the Islamophobic narrative of the state and the patriarchal society at the same time. And that is what is commendable. And that is what, um, you know, uh, that is why I cannot stop myself from definitely mentioning that, you know, uh, it was definitely, um, you know, a pr protest in which Muslim women came out in large numbers. Uh, the, were they leading or not? Uh, in some cases, yes. In some cases, no. That is how it should be you know um finally uh, i have two minutes safa tells me uh, just uh, uh, to to conclude you know uh, i say that uh, you know because i i wanted to talk specifically about women uh, the recent uh, the recent attacks on uh, again the the sully by the github i i would want to call it the github uh, platform the attacks that have happened on the github platform on women on muslim women specifically uh, you know uh, they are not new and they need to be, it needs to be understood that, you know, uh, Muslim women have always been under attack by the state, albeit in different ways. Earlier, it was the uh, saving narrative. And now it is that, you know, uh, that Muslim, uh, the, the character assassination or, you know, auctioning of Muslim women that is happening. And we saw it, the, the narrative became mainstream, I think, when women, Muslim women decided to shatter the Islamophobic narratives that were created by the state, you know, uh, by way of uh, coming out in large numbers and accessing the public spaces and being vocal against the government th themselves. And it was at its peak during the Shaheen Bagh movement when every day some the, or the other fake news against the Muslim women was peddled. And, you know, uh, we saw... Um, Walter journalists taking uh, taking it on and it going viral on the social media, but we never acted, uh, and that is the result why sully deals and bully deals is uh, is happening today. Uh, so again, it is it is important it is important to understand that why these attacks are happening against vocal Muslim women. It is to crush the dissent that you know uh, that Muslim women. Uh, are, I would say, are, are leading in, you know. Uh, uh, finally, uh, uh, Shaheen Bagh movement is like um, a lot of other movements, like I would say um, the Indian freedom struggle. It doesn't end at the uh, at the revolt of 1857 or the non-cooperation movement. It goes beyond that. And I see Shaheen Bagh like that. Uh, finally, um, I would like to say that uh, the uh, in the coming years, it's not like uh, the anti-CA movement or uh, or any other movement for reclaiming the identity of Muslims is not going to happen again. It's n it should not be seen like that. And uh, we have decided that we are going to fight for the dignity and respect that we deserve in this country as equal citizens of this country, which is granted by the constitution of this country and as India being a democratic country. Uh, thank you so much for listening to me.